Good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday. Uh, hope you're all doing well. And uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be back with Worktrip introducing and to welcome Andy Middleton, who is founding director of the TYF group and co-organizer of the Do Lectures and also the Hay on Earth Sustainability Seminars. Um, and just for a bit of context, uh, the TYF group is a leadership adventure and sustainability education business that takes over 12,000 people a year to play and work in wild and natural landscapes, which is an incredible thing. Um, so uh, for uh, the purposes of today, as always, if you want to uh, drop any comments uh, under the live feed uh, for this, we'll get them and we can answer any questions or respond to any comments. So please feel free to do that. And you can listen back to this both on uh, the Future of Teams podcast and on our YouTube channel as well. So Andy, uh, hello and uh, first of all how are you uh, feeling and how are you doing today? All good so it's it's at last the summer day has arrived here at the end of August and it's summer's back for a couple of days which is lovely so it's surrounded by blue skies here on the west coast of Wales. Well that's that's awesome to hear and yeah I'm also very pleased that the weather has turned um, so first question I've got here is you've been gathering teams for over 30 years. Um, what remains the same and what has changed over that time, do you think? I guess one of the things that's remained the same is that, you know, things still get important things still get better done by groups of people working together towards common goals. And I think what's changed most significantly for many people is that the, the goal of just getting more stuff out the door at any price is no longer the thing that drives everyone in the workplace. And I think it's really encouraging to see that. So in the past, I think just getting more and more things out the door to make more money, to get more promotion, to do whatever would have been enough. And actually now people are questioning what's the thing they want to get out the door. And I think for me, that's the most encouraging thing is that people do care but don't necessarily know how to work together in different ways. And I think the other bit that's changed is that in the past, the challenges that we used to get from, say, clients in manufacturing was getting, say, teams working on different shifts mm. to cooperate because they'd compete shift to shift. And, and that whilst I'm sure that still happens at some level, the bigger challenge now is not only getting organisations in the same sector to collaborate, but getting organizations in different sectors and from di completely different places. So for instance, getting teams in health and food and landscapes to think differently in works. It's a much bigger brief that people mm -hmm. have to work to in terms of applying those team skills to a much bigger challenge, I guess. Really interesting. So yeah, more in intersector and interconnected. And I think that to your first point, that 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 relates to yeah, the, the point around productivity and actually perhaps if you want that promotion, if that's still partly a driver, maybe it's doing more of the deep work rather than, you know, just ticking the boxes. So actually that ability to step back is now a sort of uh, premium skill, as it were, uh, rather than just sort of continuously chasing your tail. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's something around, you know, the figures on this scarily haven't changed that much around the percentage of people in the, in the global workforce who are actively engaged in their job still lurks always around kind of 17 to low 20 percent. And there are often more people actively disengaged at work than there are actively engaged. And one of the things that occurred to us way, way back when we started was to say, how on earth is it that organizations can't find a sense of purpose that connects people to their work so that they want to bring their hearts as well as their minds to the job and don't mind talking about play things at work in the same way that they wouldn't mind sometimes talking about work things when they're playing because actually yeah. we are one human we are one life and connected to people in all those different ways so i think it's there's, there's a sense of how do we how do we create meaningful work that also fits in with the new different patterns around remote working and different values and different demands i think on people's times of that um Sort of related to this a little bit. So I mentioned in the beginning, co-organizer of the Do Lectures and you know, way back when, when uh, we were thinking of setting up work trip, that was a real, the Do Lectures were a real inspiration. Um, and, you know, 
partly that was around how do you get something of that sort that that kind of the special magic that comes when you bring people together for every team um and for those that don't know and I don't know if I've got this exactly right but part of how I see the do lectures the the, the magic of it is around the size of it and I, I'm not sure if it's a hundred tickets but I know that it's a sort of limited ticketed event um so I wondered what your thoughts were on the importance of the scale of gathering and, and, and how that affects how everyone turns up as well. No, great question. So, I mean, I, I've, so the do lectures run physically once a year um, here on the West Coast of Wales in Cardigan. It was started by David and Claire Hyatt, and I was lucky to get involved from sort of before day one. And they've run in, they've run in, run in Australia and America and a few other places as well. Mm. Um, and but the main the kind of the mother event so to speak has always been here in Wales, and I think the one of the things that makes the events distinctive is this obsession to detail around creating the space that makes people feel special, and weirdly in a way feeling really pampered but not spoiled. So that there's so much care goes into the creation of the space that makes people feel relaxed and comfortable. We have no badges, so people don't know. The only people who are badged, so to speak, are the volunteers or this amazing team of 40 people who kind of make, who bring the event to life through the kind of the food and the bars and keeping the bonfires lit and all that kind of work. But of the rest of the people, you don't know whether people have paid a full price ticket or the one of the ones who've been given a free ticket through our giving chairs. You don't know if they're a speaker or a guest or anything else. And so, so there's none of this nonsense around status status gazing to see if the person that you're talking to is worth talking to mm -hmm. particularly which is a horrible thing at kind of conferences and stuff but it really brings people together in a way that people remember for life and i think when you compare those kind of experiences you know where there are conversations at two o'clock in the morning under the stars about some of the most important things that people have ever talked about or doing yoga at seven o'clock in the morning or sitting in the sauna singing songs all of those create the memorable experiences that I think are too often missing from those kind of factory run conference center with the sound of air conditioning, kitchen fans and everything, mm -hmm. else, everything else running. So for us, it's about physical space, you know, having amazing food, music, participation. We do look what I was singing and stuff, and it, it, but it brings people together in a way that I think in many ways, in a really lovely way, shocks people because I don't think they realized it was possible to create events of that quality. And I think that's something that, you know, we're, we're really excited about working with you in terms of how do we create that at scale though, to get people connected to nature and thinking differently as we go forwards. Yeah, absolutely. And so the scale doesn't have to be at one event. It could just be that you are able to then deliver multiple of these smaller events where you can have that attention to detail. I think it's quite, quite exciting, but let's get on to that. So um, you mentioned collaborating together um I mean let's jump into that and we can come back to some of the other bits but um yeah we've we've kind of been um chatting about the opportunity to collaborate on this pilot concept called the nature of thriving so perhaps for everyone listening in could you share a little bit about how that's shaping up and you know why that idea came about and, and uh you know what success would look like when 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 hopefully the collaboration uh kicks off and and we start to get our first la learning partners through that program as well sure and i'd love to do that so um my introduction to the idea of thriving in terms of this context was in conversations with an amazing um canadian based uh canada based facilitator and writer called michelle holiday and she talks about the idea that thriving is so much more compelling than sustainability. You know, sustainable doesn't doesn't kind of get people, doesn't connect people's hearts. And the idea, if you say, how was your how was your meal last night? Oh, it was sustainable. <laughs> it means it's kind of got the minimum level of minimum level yeah. of calories in it. How's your love life? Or oh, it's sustainable. We've got two kids. Kind of and it's not it's not a place to to dream to achieve in. And the kind of sure sustainability is a stepping stone, but working out how we get to thrive, like to live our best lives in a way that's connected to community and nature and future generations, I think is a really important piece. And what, what occurs to us is that at a broad level, you know, one of the things that we've learned 
ending in taking something like 200,000 people to play and learn in potentially dangerous places is that the, the best way to keep people safe is to be prepared for every risk that you could imagine happening in the duration of your time outdoors. And that idea of being prepared for things before they happen seems like a really obvious thing to do if you're working in the outdoors or if you're working in, in a risky environment. Yet, when it comes to climate and nature crisis, most organizations don't even think of applying that principle about being prepared. So the bit that really excites me is to say, how do we, how do we create the space and the time and the compulsion in many ways for organizations to step forward and say, we need to get all of our employees connected to nature in such a way that they can join the dots between their well-being and ability to thrive and that of nature and the and the kind of and the living things that are within it thrive as well. And it's really hard to do that just by looking at listening to podcasts or watching, even watching, you know, watch, watching Chris Packham or David Bellamy, David, David Attenborough doesn't give you that, doesn't give you that insight. You have to bring it alive through visceral, emotional, sensory experiences in nature that haven't got to be complex, but they mm -hmm. do need to be grounded. Because I think it's really hard to expect people to care for things that they don't understand. And, and, to, and to how do you expect people to take big, tricky decisions sometimes about the way that they're going to present their ideas and their, their imagination at work if, about things that they don't care and love. So for us, mm -hmm. it's how do we create the space for organizations to take their employees through a process of connecting them to nature and the climate crisis in a way that connects head and heart so that action becomes um, correlated with the scale of change needed as we go forward. So for us, it's about nature-based experiences where the conversations connect what's happening in nature to what happens in the operations room or the boardroom or anywhere else. And I know that there's uh, a lot of interest at the moment around uh, the concept of sort of nature on the board and there are sort of high profile um, examples of that, but you've spoken before about, you know, that not necessarily being the only way to go about things. Do you want to kind of expand on that idea as well? Sure, so so Faith in Nature um, in August, 2022 became the first company in the U under UK law and, make it, and potentially globally to formally put nature on the board of their company as a non-exec director and i think it's a fantastic thing to do and other companies are continuing that and they've open sourced the the information on what what to do about that which you can find on the on on the faith in nature website and i guess for me it's what what's striking about their experience is that wasn't really the process of putting nature on the board that made the biggest difference but talking to the employees about why they've done it because it's the connection bit that changes people's behavior not just the idea and so by all means i think it's great that we have you know the voice of nature on the board of companies for as long as needed for people and for employees to kind of catch up but the reason that we don't have profit on the board is because it's it's embedded in everything that people do and ideally we'd get to a point where we could take nature off the board because it's in every single employee's heart and informs the way that they think and that they design and the way that they make decisions. So for me, I think it's a great thing to do, but the most important first step is just to work out how do we get employees every single day to act as though nature mattered and climate mattered in the decisions that they make. Absolutely. And, you know, if anyone's watching or listening to this back, then, um, you know, the, the concept is if you're already seeking to get your team together, um, you know, through this collaboration, we can essentially bring together the expertise to help companies to bring that challenging thinking into their organization and perhaps go beyond the the existing questions or the existing comfort zones um, into something perhaps a bit more profound and a bit more uh, organizational wide as well uh, and, and, and yeah absolutely and I think and I think something that some that strikes us and I think we've touched on before Sophie as well is the way that it's it's really easy to kind of go through off sites and team events and so on in a kind of pretend world and I've, I've talked about this before in the way that it's a little bit like organizations see their performance 
through the reflection in, in a mirror they nicked from Snow White. And, it, and this, the magic mirror is kind of mirror, a mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all. And, that gives, and the mirror that they look at is the one that they see ESG and company performance through in a pretend world where everything's okay. Because the actual mirror, the Snow White mirror, so to speak, is, was put up over a window to the world. And, it, and what we're inviting companies to do is take the, take the pretend mirror off the wall that gives you the answers that you want to hear. Oh, it's great. I love your paper recycling or the fact that you've stopped doing plastic straws or you've got a, you've got a, you've got a, a tiny project. And actually you ask them, looking out on the world of change around climate and what, you know, this last week it's been about climate fires in kind of in northern Canada and in Hawaii, cities being evacuated or burnt to the ground. You know, change is happening much, much faster than expected. And if we look at what that's what's happening out there and ask ourselves, what is it that we would do in terms of setting what we would call your kind of North Star, your true North goals? So goals that take into account the full magnitude of the nature and clim climate crisis, but integrate that response into a profitable and enjoyable way of running a business that matters for com companies, customers and communities. And so I think for us, it's saying using the nature connection to connect your heart and your head to the kind of actions that matter, taking into account the wider context and linking back and to the experiences that, that we've done. Engagement with uh, employees 100%. and with teams, uh, you know, we know that they're seeking more purpose driven business and, you know, not 100%. just uh, paying lip service to that. So, um, yeah, and I think with and I think with that as well is trying to make sure we reconcile i suppose the this tension that people feel that you know they might be at home talking to their partners or talking to their kids about what's actually happening in the world and most people you know well north of 80 percent people really care about what's happening but they go to work and have to put this kind of snow white mask on of just working things through different and i think we need to bring the whole person to those work solutions so it is people don't separate themselves from the work person from the life person Absolutely. And partly that's about going back to all of the things that cut through, you know, a good offsite. So recognizing the culture, building that psychological safety. So you can stand up and say, well, this is great, but we're sort of tinkering around the edges. Have you thought of X? And that, that can be quite a, you know, scary thing if you're talking about completely changing a business model or a completely different way of doing business. But, you know, that's what these spaces are for ultimately. So. And, and there's, there's a really important piece to that in some work done by an organization in Mid Wales called Common Cause. And they, they, they did this research on thing called the values perception gap. And the perception, what they showed is that the perception is that in a group of 10 people, people think that only one other person is, com is as compassionate as them. Mm -hmm. and, and people like Rutger Bregman talk about this in Humankind as well. But the reality is that actually seven other people care as much as you. But because the perception is that you're going to be in the minority for speaking out about what you care about, people don't talk. But when they do have the confidence to talk, they realize that everyone else cares, almost everyone thinks the same as them. So it's having, finding that space for people to express their heart and their emotions, as well as the kind of the technical side of their kind of brain, the, the kind of the, the enterprise thinking and bringing those two together in different ways. And I mean, the beauty of this is that, you know, you, you've got sort of 30 years in this space, real depth of network also in that space. It, with Worktrip, we bring together coaches and facilitators, and some of those are, uh, you know, have specialism in, in that area as well. Uh, but also venues set in nature, so those don't have to be in a certain location, because as we know, many of the teams we're now working with are sort of distributed, so they seek different areas but the idea really is to is to take this concept forward bring bring teams in learn from the experience and uh you know ultimately help more and more teams to to go through this process so yeah we would invite uh teams who are interested and who want to take that co courageous conversation to actually get in touch and um you know start that process essentially because uh, it's it is not, that, it's, and I think, it's getting easier. No, and I think it's it's and you know, one of the most powerful questions that we ask people. And in some ways, it's 
it's really disappointing that it feels like a fresh question. But is this one about saying, you know, taking into account the current context and taking into account what's happening, what is it you'd set out to do if you took full account of that and knew that you couldn't fail? And, and, it's, and for many people, it's the first time they've ever asked that question. But it's only, I think, by finding those common interests about, well, actually, if we couldn't fail, we would do this with our business, we do this with our customers, that you can start then to work out, well, how on earth do you work backwards from that future to the start point that you're at today? So the, a key piece, I think, with residential programs, and although they've, you know, an offsite, I mean, sometimes it's perfectly valid to go away and be frivolous because you've been busting the gut doing a project and you just want to get away together and kick back and just enjoy each other's company for nothing other than having a chance to breathe. I'm sure there's a place for that. But the, the things that we focus on are saying, how do you relate what happens in, the, in nature, those experiences and those conversations back to what happens in the workplace at a practical level in a way that can be managed and measured and contribute to where the business changes. And I think too often in the past, the kind of the touchy feeling nature bits never related back to what happens in the, in the workplace. And for us, connecting those two with really strong links so that people know how they're going to make change happen. They know what the conversations are, who they're going to talk to, and what the uncertainties are that they share together that they need to work their way through to create space for a different kind of a different quality of hope and possibility. And you've mentioned a couple of really fantastic people on this call already. Um, so either authors or researchers. Um, you know, are there are there any others that you would love to share with people listening in that you think are really worth um, picking up? So either authors or podcasts, or I know, you know, I know we talked about it's not just about that, but just to kind of get some inspiration and get some thoughts going already. Um, any any other sure. references you'd love to share? So I think without making the assumption that kind of people people know all of this stuff already, I think the kind the kinds of some of the totemic books and writers on this subject. I make sure that you know, in any team, in any organisation, I'd, I'd want to see everyone understanding the basics of what it means to live in a circular economy. So I'd, re I'd, rec I'd strongly recommend Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics. You know, it's a really simple, powerful reframing of how we need to live within the Earth's limits whilst creating a just future for everyone on planet Earth. So Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics is one. There's a really powerful book on how do we shift from being consumed, how do we co stop calling ourselves consumers and become citizens? And that's John Alexander's work called Citizens Book of the same title. I think Rutger Bregman's Humankind, which I mentioned earlier about this idea about how do we recognize that we are, that we are, that we are capable and our normal setting, our base setting is to be kind to each other. I'd, I'd think I'd read Roman Krasnarek's book, The Good Ancestor, to understand what's our role in time. And one of the exercises that we do with groups, which is particularly, um, it's, it's wonderful to do like on a big beach, some, such as some of the ones we have here in West Wales, is to draw out a timeline of the earth in 12 months over, as a line in the sand. And so you can imagine, say, a 450 meter line that's a 4.5 billion year history that but told through the months of the year and humans appeared two seconds to midnight mm. and until then we were part of, you know we, we are we are born from 3.8 billion years of evolution and we were already shaping the future of our species and of the earth through the way that we're damaging our ecosystems and i think helping people see themselves in time is really important so the um the good ancestors are really good way of framing how do we want to be the people who many generations forward would thank us for the decisions that we're making today. And I think in terms of podcasts, there's a um, there's a really lovely education and learning one called Coconut Thinking, hosted by Benjamin Freud, which I really like. And we're working with Benjamin um, on how to take the learnings in some ways around that, the work that Faith and Nature did, into the education context and put nature on the school board. And I really love um, op outrage and optimism for an up-to-date spending on that and there's there's many interesting things as well within the the rest is politics work as well as Alistair Campbell and Rory Stewart so those are those are a few of the ones that I listen to on a regular basis 
Amazing. I love that. And we'll just do one really quick one because we always ask everyone this question as well. Um, what do you think are the key elements of creating a good offsite? So if you had to distill down everything you've seen, what does it really come down to? I think it it really comes down to like asking that why question. And you know, why are we doing it? What's it for? What difference do you want it to make? And you know, in the early days when we would ask clients that question, you know, people come to us, I want to do a team build and say, great, what for? Oh, we always do one. That's really nice, but what's it for? <laughs> We want people to be more productive. Well, what does that mean? And I think sometimes to kind of really understand what difference do you want that event to make? Like in, in immediately, like in the first few weeks that people go back, we wanted to start some different conversations or we wanted to refocus our strategy. But having the courage to really interrogate the reason that you're bothering to take people away in the first place and be clear about the difference that, that makes. And I think there's something around the anchors that we create through good experience design is that, you know, I've been, I've been in too many corporate hotels over the years where people at the bar are talking about who's the most famous speaker that they've ever had at a conference and they're meaningless. And I think for me, the, com the conversations that we know matter are about the experiences that people have had. Mm. So when, when we take people co-steering for instance, and eat, fresh pepper dull seaweed straight off the rocks where it's growing on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean and talk about ocean health and gut health and food. People remember those experiences literally for life, whereas some celeb speaker will be gone from their memory within days. So I think for me, it's really understand that question. Why are we doing this? And what difference do you want it to make to our business within the bigger context of change that we're operating? Amazing. Thank you. And I can I couldn't agree more. Um, having experienced both those worlds, perhaps not the pepper seaweed, uh, but, you know, I'm sure that will come and I look forward to that day as well. Um, so I've, I've been on the wrong tab, so I have not been uh, noticing the comments, but we do have some. So let's just go through those. Uh, so Sally says, Andy, can you share the most memorable experience, a real aha moment you've seen a, ta a team have when they've created that space in nature? Yeah, there was a lovely, there's a love one of the experiences that we one of the experiences that we did was um, working with working with a group of MBA students from Canada who are visiting us, and we created this nature, it's like a, a thing called a human camera experience in nature, asking taking taking people to different places in the in the wild space, and asking them to and we tap someone on the shoulder and for ask them to open their eyes for three seconds, and look at something fresh and just notice what they see in that space do something really close say medium distance and something kind of horizon and one of the things that people notice is that when they when they look fresh at like the presence of like nylon rucksacks and all of the tat of just going on a normal hike day and seeing what that looked like in nature was a real shock to people to realize how badly we've actually ended up designing the products and accessories that we use in day to life and how alien they looked at nature. So I think that was one of the things that really helped people, really helped people get that different perspective. And, and the seaweed piece that I mentioned earlier, when we've interviewed people months after their experience of coast hearing with us, that that the impact of I guess the the experience of taste and cold water and a story sticks mm. with people for, for months and months because it's so visceral and mm -hmm. it and it changes those relationships in seconds. So if we get the experiences right, you can change people's minds in two or three seconds about how to shift their view of the world. And from that, of course, you can explore other possibilities. And so I think well, for me, the, the aha is, is, is finding a way of seeing nature from a different perspective you didn't exist. And one other for Sally, I think, would be we did a, a lovely piece of work with a guy uh, called Andy Shipley I met through the Do Lectures who is visually impaired. I haven't got, I haven't got any blind friends. And Andy was the first one that I spent any amount of time with. And we realized that his experience of nature was invisible to me, was as invisible to me as my way of seeing it as, as, as his was. And so we created a, an experience called Super Sense, where we got blind people to help sighted people see nature differently. And it was incredibly powerful because we just suddenly tapped into a whole bunch of senses around taste and about taste and texture than smell that we'd never ever used in the past to go and experience those woodlands and stuff.
So it was really powerful too. I love that. I love that. Um, and, and on that, uh, about, about the uh, it being memorable, so Katie says, a few years back, I arranged a trip for my team at TYF as a reward for winning a company award. Uh, it was just about kicking back, as Andy just said, no work, just being together. That team has since disbanded, but we still talk about it. It was a career high. <laughs> so that must feel very good. Well, and I just think it just, I suppose it's, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily easy to create experiences that do that, but it's, it's within everyone's reach. And I just think it takes a bit of imagination and courage to go beyond the kind of M25 typical kind of corporate loop hotel. And if you want people to remember things, the experiences don't necessarily have to be expensive, but they have to have an authenticity to them and an honesty. And I think, you know, we, we forget that, you know, most of the people that we spend time with on corporate programs are the kinds of people who come down here to this place like St. David's in summer and go camping with their kids and stay in cottages and stay in caravans. You know, they're humans. They like doing that stuff. So we haven't got to get stuck in this loop of like five-star luxury. Mm. People, people camp at the do lectures and love it. You know, learning, how, but learn, t teaching people how to light a fire sometimes can be a, a life-changing experience too. So I think it can, auth authenticity and grace and quality and, you know, amazing food and, you know, proper, if you're going to have beers and stuff, make sure that they're as good as they can be because it, it doesn't cost much more, but it doesn't need to be lazy. Yeah. So I think that's the thing. Watch out for the laziness trap in terms Agreed. of just doing things that are easy. Yeah, because it can save a few hours, but ultimately you don't achieve what you wanted in the end. So uh couldn't agree more. Um, well, that brings us to time. So I'm going to let you go, Andy. No, it's been an absolute um, pleasure. Yeah, real pleasure as well. And thank you so much for sharing so much. And yeah, we will, we will share the link to The Nature of Thriving for anyone uh, interested. And yeah, I hope very much to see lots of new thinking on that as a result but uh yeah andy thank you again no, and great and we can report back on people's experiences as we go through that which i really look forward to doing as well yeah we'd love to do that great take care and have a brilliant yeah, day lovely to meet you take care okay bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.